So we're in one of Logi's other greenhouses. This is actually primarily the begonia house, but you have other plants in here. And there's not enough space for the two of us to kind of navigate through. So Byron is going to be taking us through some of his favorite plants in this house. In this house, we have many stock plants, and we also have plants that we use for um, our research and development, which is bringing new plant material um, online. So when plant material comes in, it'll often go in this house. It's a warm greenhouse. This runs at a minimum of about 62 degrees in the wintertime. So this is where everything that's really tropical would um, spend its time. Um, we also do, um, our begonias are grown in here, our mother plants. And, um, and I've been doing some breeding with them, so I want to show you some of that that we're working on. So you can see here, this is, these are our mother plants of some of our begonia collection. Um, they've just gone through a pruning. Many of them are pretty small right now, so periodically they have to be trimmed back. Everything grows, and so we have to uh, maintain the size on them. Um, this is an interesting plant, which just happened to be plunked down here, but this is um, a um, avrahoa or a star fruit, and this is a tropical fruit. Um, this is a selection of star fruit that fruits very young and very heavily in small containers, and um, it's another plant that um, we have to graft um, to get the true plant on the um, rootstock. Uh, but the interesting thing about this is the mother plant that this came from was uh, many years old, I'm not sure the age of it, but it was an old plant and it was only eight feet tall and it was just dripping with fruit. There were fruit on the ground underneath it and um, I asked if I could get a piece of cyan wood from it and the um, people that had it um, offered it to me and um, the name of it is Mar Dwarf and um, the quality of the fruit is pretty good if you let it really ripen. So star fruit generally, if you just grow a seedling of that, you're going to find a fruit that's almost inedible. It's like um, just a stray apple seed. Um, so the star fruits that we eat commercially um, have relatively high sugar content. And this has pretty good eating quality to it if you let them get very ripe. But the production on it is very high. So even in a small container like this, you can see we have many, um, many fruit. Yeah, so this is, um, these are some of the hybrids that we're working on here at Logies um, in the rhizomatous group of begonias. And um, we've been doing this for a number of years. And this group of um, seedlings that we have here are um, selections from our last year's um, seeding. And so out of um, hundreds and hundreds of young seedlings, we've selected out um, plants that we want to go forward with our breeding or that we're going to introduce into the trade. So you can see this one has a very red leaf to it. Um, we're trying to increase the red color in it. There's another one with very, um, a lot of red in it that's, um, it's still kind of a brown and a little muted, but we're trying to work that up. Here's, a, here's one, and this is probably something that would, um, we could actually um, offer to our customers because a, the leaf color is really unique and, um, and very defined. And <clears throat> one thing that we do with, um, with our work here is we want to make sure that we go through um, an entire year cycle because begonia leaves change a lot in color um, from season to season. This is one that um, is definitely going to make our release. You can see the, the f color on this. It's a beautiful chartreuse with all that flecking inside um, and the curl. And the form of this is very nice. It's very tight. The leaf petioles are very short. Um, so it definitely be, that's something that's actually reached the grade at which um, Logies will um, name it and stop producing it for our customers. Uh, we have some other interesting ones here. This one here is a spiral with this um, veining of color in it. Um, we're probably going to work a little longer on that to try to get a little more um, density and compactness to it, but um, certainly we've come out with a, a great deal of um, interesting color in that leaf form. And um, this is another one that a lot of our recent hybrids have had um, a lot of the oranges and browns in them, but um, this is one that actually had some stability in the color. You can see the patterning on the leaf there, um, but it's not that bright, but it did maintain it through our summer months when things can actually get um, pretty brown, the colors actually get um, fade. So this is actually something that we would choose to um, work with, probably using it as one of the parents of seedlings. This is um, 
Soli mutata, which is a beautiful species out of um, uh, Brazil. It has a really wonderful um, leaf color to it. You can see it's in flower now, and um, in you know, very, very compact form. It's really um, sort of on the rhizomatous um, side of begonias, as it has a rhizome that grows. But very um, enduring plant, because it's been in the greenhouses for you know, decades and still holds a lot of vigor to it, which many begonias tend to um, go backwards on us in terms of their vigor. Um, due to um, viruses or bacteria uh, and such things as that. But this one is actually one that's been a mainstay. And there's been some hybrids done off of it. I did a few, uh, quite a few years ago. Um, it doesn't really cross that well with everything, but um, there's been some hybrids done with that. There's some more of our um, young seedlings that we're working with. This is a new plant. So this would be something that we got recently and, um, and we're trying to we're really trying to do something. And it's pretty exciting when suddenly we start to get flowers on these new plants to see what they are. This is a notia, um, and it's an endangered species in the Malvaceae family. And you can see the buds are just starting to um, form here. So uh, pretty exciting. I mean, there's images of this, um, of its um, flowers. So it's gonna be sort of like the Scotchman's purse, the Malva viscous type flower with it is a long tube, flowers are white on it, but it's, it's exciting for us because this is the first time we're gonna see it. And I got the seeds in from um, David Orr and the Waimea Falls Botanical Garden in Hawaii, and he sent me seeds and we've cultured them and we brought them up. And, and now within the next few weeks, we're gonna actually um, see the plant do its thing. And well, we also have our cocoa. There's our cocoa tree, which is chocolate. You can see the young pods here forming on um, some of the trunk. Um, you see it's quite a big tree. We have to periodically prune the top out of it. Um, and interestingly enough, this pot, if you look at where the pot is, there's one forming way down at the bottom there. That's interesting. But the pot actually sat here for a very long time without being moved. And the plant went through the bottom of the pot into the ground. And so now this chocolate tree has um, attached itself to this spot in this greenhouse and uh, we're probably not going to move it. Um, eventually there'll probably be some trouble with the uh, girdling as it went through the hole at the bottom of the pot. But this coffee tree, this is where it lives. And what we do with this is um, uh, we'll raise these pods till they're ripe and then we'll harvest the seeds out of them. And I have made chocolate out of it. It wasn't very good chocolate, but I did make chocolate out of it. I got the pods and I fermented them and then, um, and then I tried roasting them and, and I ate some and yeah, I don't, I, I don't recommend, well you can try it, but it's interesting. Um, but we'll actually um, take these and raise young plantlets off of it. So inside of that, there's probably 15 or 20 seeds. Chocolate is an interesting um, seed in that it has to be sown very fresh, so you can't let it dry out. You take it out of the pod, you put it in. But the interesting thing is just when you do plant it right out of the pod like that, you get almost 100% germination, which is um, pretty, pretty good. And they come right up um, out of the flats. They're big seeds, so they come right up out of the flat as a dicot and, and just take off from there. So this is another plant which is, um, we're actually working on this. It's a little bit more challenging, but this is uh, Brighamia. In Cygnus, which is um, cabbage on a stick. Um, there's one here which we can actually see the cabbage on a stick. And this is a, um, a native of Hawaii and Kauai in particular, and it's an endangered species um, that grows on cliffs. Um, and the issue with this plant is that the pollinators have now gone extinct. So there's a insect, a moth or such things that um, would pollinate this and we no longer have them. So the Brickhammer itself can no longer reproduce in the wild. Um, and it has some issues in terms of its culture that we're trying to work through. Um, and hopefully um, we can figure it out and solve it so that it can um, be brought to our customers. Um, there's a young plant there you can see. That one. That's an interesting plant, it puts out this I don't know, it's not really a cortex, but it's this trunk that forms on there. Here's another one here. This is our oldest plant. And they actually go through a summer dormancy. So you can see this is just starting to flush out on the top here with new growth. Um, so they actually, this one actually dropped all its leaves, just dropped most of them. And now this flush, which happens to be in the wintertime, um, is putting on this um, flush of new growth. Very interesting plant. And I think it will make a great house plant, indoor plant 
where it's isolated and is sunny and you've got a, quite a bit of dryness on it because it does tolerate um, dry conditions quite easily. This is a plant that <clears throat> came to us via a friend who is a citrus collector and this is our red finger lime which um, puts out all these little Australian finger limes but there are, it's actually a hybrid, and it's a hybrid between the rang poor lemon and citrus australasica sanguinea, which is the red one. And it produces um, a reddish fruit that's just starting to ripen here. You can see the color is starting to develop on the skin. But it's a very produ prolific producer. I mean, underneath here, it's kind of thorny. Underneath here, there's just dozens of fruit. You can see them, they're starting to turn red. Um, and Interesting enough, it's weepy. It has a kind of a cascading habit to it. So as a indoor or potted plant, it really never can get out of hand. It's just something you have to trim the bottom off of and it just stays as this kind of compact spreading plant. It also flowers um, in late winter as most citrus do, but it has an extremely fragrant flower, not citrus at all, more gardenia or jasmine like, and a wonderful fragrance. Flowering goes on for a period of time, and it's actually, there's so many flowers appear on this that actually when you walk by it, you can pick up the fragrance from it. This is a interesting gardenia. I remember years ago, I saw pictures of it, and I finally found it at a, a grower in Florida, but this is gardenia nitida. And gardenias are typically difficult plants to culture, mainly because of the root disease problems they have. Um, and also because of the difficulty they have in, um, with root rot and also the aborting of flowers um, in a home situation. But this one is actually a variant of that. It really doesn't look like a gardenia per se, but it has a very strong root system and the flowers always emerge. And it happens over a long period of time for us. Um, we probably get six to eight months of blooming out of this um, if you don't prune it back. Um, and it has a interesting smell, which is very sweet, but it's not a gardenia. It's another fragrance to it. Um, strong at night, you can see the long tube, so that means that it probably has a um, night pollinator, nighttime pollinator. Yeah, this is um, black sapote, which is um, actually a tropical, a tropical persimmon. And it does quite well um, fruiting in containers. Here at Logies, we do quite a bit with tropical fruiting plants. We're always searching for the plant that'll actually do it in a pot rather than having to turn into like a 60 foot tree that you know you'd never see um, fruit on. Um, but the interesting thing about this is it fruits and sets fruit very well, but if fruit takes a long time to ripen, they can hang on here for you know, almost two years before um, they ripen. And the interior of the fruit is actually looks like chocolate. So it's like when it gets ripe, it, it um, gets soft and it's almost like chocolate pudding. And it doesn't have, it has more of a starchy taste to it. If it, they get dead ripe, they're really quite delicious. There's enough sweetness in them that you can eat them. Um, and in this situation, uh, we actually don't get pollination on them, so there's really no um, seeds inside for it. But it's kind of ornamental in the fact that they'll just hang on there for a very long time, and you can come in and they'll always be there until they finally ripen. This is actually a mango tree, and I really don't, at this time of year, we don't have any um, mangoes on it. But we trial mangoes a lot because mangoes are actually a well-known fruit and very good to eat. And, um, and um, you know, the question is, is can I grow them in a pot? And this is a cultivar or a variety called Pickering. And um, as far as we've tested, and we've tested quite a few over the years, this is the best for containers. Um, its nature is often described as dwarf, but it's really not dwarf as much as it's kind of an outgrowing and kind of a weeping variety. Um, and it fruits very easily, and they'll put on, you know, we usually get about 10 or 15 fruit off of a plant this size. It'll put out its flowers, and, um, and then the fruit is just like your Hayden mango in the store, like you'd buy large mangoes. Um, and they do ripen uh, fully on the plant. A lot of mangoes in the north here will drop before they ripen and be kind of green and um, uh, before you can actually eat them. But this one actually does the whole thing and fruits in a pot. So if you're ever thinking of working with a potted mango picking ring, in our opinion, at least at this point, is the best. So one of the plants that has actually had a lot of um, attention in recent years are the medanillers. And 
Some of them become very large commercial crops um, coming out of Holland and being shipped into um, the U.S. Magnifica, Medinilla Magnifica is probably the most famous of them. Um, but this is actually the red Medinilla. This is uh, Medinilla miniata. And um, you can see the red flowers on it with the red bracts. The flowers are somewhat smaller than Magnifica, and they actually get a little bit bigger than this um, from time to time. But it puts out these beautiful red, deep red bracts of flowers on long pendulous um, stems. And it's a very big plant. You see the leaf span on that um, from tip to tip. So it's a, look at the leaf on that, it's a giant. But it's really hard to propagate um, in the sense they're trying to get the numbers up where we can actually produce it for sale for our customers. It's going to be a long time. Um, we keep working at it, but I think that probably um, tissue culture is probably the best way, or growing it by a seed, which it's not self-fertile here at Logies. We've tried it quite a few times. The seed never germinates, but um, getting um, another clone in from another source possibly could um, solve that problem. Here we have a fruiting plant from South America. Uh, the genus is Plinkentia, and it puts out these large seed pods. Uh, when ripe, they turn brown, and then the nut is harvested and roasted, or the seed inside is from it, which is an oil extracted. And uh, we got the plant in from a grower in Hawaii and grew it, and the problem was is after we got through a cycle of it, the nematodes just took it out. So the plant actually came in with nematodes from Hawaii, which is really not a good thing. But um, we took the seed from that and we um, raised the seeds that we got, which were a few, and we started over again. And now it's free from nematodes. And the thing turned out to be um, quite the prolific. Look at the fruit on that. And what will happen is, is you open them up, roast them, and then eat them. It has a very interesting flower. It's, um, because we're in Connecticut, it's kind of um, uh, going by here, but um, this is the um, stamen, and then the uh, male flowers uh, come up on this long stalk, and there's the, you've got a tiny little spot here, there's the ovary from which the fruit will form. So it's a monaceous, am I right? Monaceous, male and female on the same plant. So it's a monaceous plant, uh, much like begonias and corn. Um, and um, we, we've got a huge crop here of fruit, so it's, the test is gonna be, can we harvest them and roast them and then eat them and make it viable for um, uh, those of us that grow in pots in the north, um, a plant that we could actually use as food. This is a famous plant which um, I think had its fame. It's probably waning a little bit. This is Suncephalum dulcificum, or the miracle fruit of miracle berry. Um, and you can see the fruit right here, which um, turn red when they're ripe. And there's a lot of, it's in heavy fruit production right now, so there's um, a lot of green fruit. You can see the flowers right here, flowers right here. And there's green fruit forming on the back sides of these leaves right here. So there's, you can see them up in here. And what this does is you eat the berry and there's a seed inside and then the flavor is very interesting. It's sweet, it's actually viable. I mean, I, when I'm in here, I'll eat them and um, just for the fruit. But then when you eat anything sour, it turns it really, really sweet, like pickles, dry wine, if you eat a grape, it'll be the sweetest grape you ever ate in your life, or an apple. Um, and of course, lemons, that turns a lemon into this like sugary um, snack. Um, and it's an African native that comes from Southwest Africa, um, Ghana and um, Ivory Coast and such. And um, it really needs to, the trick to growing it is you have to have it in an acidic soil. It will not tolerate lime at all. Um, so we put them in a, actually a peat perlite mixture, about two-thirds peat, one-third um, perlite, and that's it. Um, and it does fine as a, as a container plant. Um, this is a, quite an old specimen. You don't definitely need to keep them. This is probably six feet tall, but you could keep them a quarter of the size of this and still get fruit. It is wind-pollinated, so um, this house is fan-ventilated, and you can see it's in the path here, so people are walking by and wiggling it as they try to 
um, walk around the corner there, and that actually helps the pollination of it. Um, it is somewhat of a slow grower um, from seed. It takes quite a few years before we get um, production size plants up, but um, we harvest the seed from it, and we plant them, and we be patient. So I don't know if I can add this in, but we had spoken about the Mar de Wolf Carambola, and you can see the amount of fruit that's up in there. It's really an amazing plant. I was so excited when I found this. And there, the thing was, is it was, um, it was in Florida and they had tests of all these plants and they had these little dwarf ones. This was one of them. And this was the only one that were like, you couldn't hardly see the plant. There was so much fruit on it. And it's actually turned out to be quite well. This is another variety. This is um, a dwarf Hawaiian. It came out of Florida for, our, for us and it was actually a selection that came out of Hawaii. And it does pretty good. I mean, it's not fruiting as heavy as it normally does this year, but it'll never keep up to Mar Dwarf. Um, it's slightly less, but it has a little more sugar to it, and, um, and it has kind of a grape, grape type um, flavor to it. Yeah, those are great plants for containers. This is another fruiting plant that um, we found in a nursery in Florida. This is the Sapodilla, um, or um, Manilka Zapote, and it puts out these egg-shaped fruits that um, when they ripen, I'm not sure there's any here that are ripe. So this is a ripe fruit, and Summer needs to have it. Hmm. Can I bite right into you it? You can bite right into it. There's probably a black seed inside. Hmm. I'm trying to say, it's almost desserty in a way. Yeah, it's not like, um, hmm. It has a little bit of vanilla in it. Like a little vanilla. Yeah, it's flavor. not at all juicy. It's got no. a lot of firm texture. Yeah. yeah. And it's got a lot of sugar. Yep, yep here's the seed. Yep. So this is a variety of Manilkara um, called Silas Woods. And Silas Woods is perhaps a dwarf, but it's a small growing, heavy, heavy fruit producing. Um, uh, Sapote, and um, and if you tried to grow the standard um, manilkas, they um, they actually turn into sixty foot trees. This thing probably would never get above eight to ten feet in height. And um, as I mentioned, it produces a lot of fruit. Matter of fact, in trying to graft this, we have so much fruit on this that we have to literally strip it off because it will not grow. It'll just, you can see the flowers here. There's flowers and new fruit coming, new fruit coming. So um, it really is a, um, uh, an ex exceptional. Um, fruit producer and container plant. Yeah, and um, also this is the source of chicle. So oh. um, if you take it off, you can see the white latex and that was what's harvested to make gum. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for showing a little bit more of your selection back here. It's just like such a amalgamation of all these different kinds of plants. And it's cool to see like your source plants, you know, from the from the actual source. Yeah. And so, you know, this is where the mother's mother stopped. Where all the moms live. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, yeah. thank you so much okay. for everything. Great. Yeah, yeah. Really appreciate it. What stock plants from Logies would you like to see back in circulation? Cast your votes in the comments below. And if you'd like to see more of this channel and see the channel grow, then click on the subscribe button and hit the notifications bell so you can be informed when the next episode launches. Don't forget that there are lots of great ways to gain more plant insights through Homestead Brooklyn while supporting the channel. Check out my book, How to Make a Plant Love You, the Houseplant Care Spreadsheets, the Houseplant Masterclass, our new shop, or you can even become a sustaining member of the channel for the price of a cup of coffee every month. Information on homesteadbrooklyn.com and in the description below.